Well, good evening, everyone, and thanks for coming along to this mechanical group presentation tonight. Thank you. Um, so just put in a wee plug for our conference that's coming up in September, 15th of September, MCONS, the Mechanical and Electrical uh, Conference. Um, our, our first one of hopefully many to come. Um, yep, please please go and have, have a look on the on the website, um, see what you think, register um, if it piques your interest. Right, on to our, our presentation tonight. Um, so our speaker comes to us um, from a um, varied and diverse um, background. He's started off with uh, gliders and then microlites. Um, over to the UK and culminating in um, working for Airbus on autonomous drones, came back to New Zealand um, in the, in the post-COVID brain gain and um, is, is currently working on um, medical devices with, with the university. Um, so that's that, that's about as much as I can remember from our little intro talk. I'll um, best, best I just um, stop talking now and, and hand over. So please... Um, welcome to our speaker tonight, Roger Warren. Thanks for that intro. Um, who, who here are pilots? Hands up. Okay. Uh, who are engineers? I presume most of you are engineers. There you go. Uh, and who's interested in building a human powered aircraft? Anyone? Oh, yeah, there's a few. Very good. Um, so my background and my bias is UK. We've, we've been flying um, uh, HPAs, human-powered aircraft, we call them HPAs. Uh, uh, the, the new impetus went in in 2011. Um, I arrived in the UK flying hang gliders, did the Birdman competition, met some people that were equally crazy, um, got working for a company called p &M Aviation, and out of that, uh, my boss was the chairman of the Human Powered Flying Group of the Royal Aeronautical Society and said, here you go, here's an aircraft of air that's been in a trailer for 10 years, actually 20 years by then, let's, let's get it flying again. Uh, and, and that was the impetus to get started. And it was perfect transition from the Birdman competitions. So my presentation is going to go through a number of my experiences plus what's been going around the world and where we've got to since pretty much since the Daedalus project. Um, this is put together from a bit of a slide from a, the British Human Powered Flying Club, which was a club that was then created from the sport that we, we initiated uh, with the Royal Aeronautical Society. Um, and so, yeah, Alec Proudfoot was another one of these guys that, that goes around the world, gives talks about human powered aircraft. He's an American that came along to our competition. Um, Let's do the next slide. So, of course, human powered aircraft solely provided by your own power. The general mechanism is through the pedals, through a chain, through some sort of gearbox. Um, we always talk about a little bit of assistance, maybe electric power to keep us going, or put some balloon in the air. And, and those ideas are great for test flights because human powered flying is, you know. A year is worth of the work and 20 seconds of flying. Um, so, uh, yeah, anything that extends your range and extends your experience is really important because what we're finding now is the limitation is you've got to have an athlete and you've got to have a pilot and they both require training. Um, and if you come in as a, as a pilot, that's great, but you might not just get off the ground, uh, but you'll at least you'll take the aircraft where you want to go. And if you come in as an athlete, you probably take it far too far, far too high. You won't know what you're doing. You won't know the limitations of the aircraft. It ends badly, and then you spend a lot of time gluing pieces together or giving up. Um, so typically the airframes, flyable airframes, are 30 kilograms to 55 kilograms. Uh, if you get much higher than that, they are fairly unsuccessful. You've got to choose a very light pilot. Uh, it's quite difficult to get an aircraft under 30 kilos. I'm going to save some questions. Yes? Would you like to come to the front? Please. And anyone else, actually, while we've got a break, 
because I'm not going to, I can't make that any bigger. And all I can do is yell louder, and that's not going to help you much. Um, so, yeah, typically we're flying speeds at six meters per second to 10 meters per second. There are aircraft that are flying faster, um, but I'm going to talk about the normal stuff, really. Uh, those are quite exceptional. Um, and the power required is between 250 to 400 watts. We're looking at those ranges, 30 to 50 kilos, um, and at six to 10 meters per second. And a pilot generally would be most people are designing aircraft for, for pilots around 75 kilos. Um, uh, so, what does 250 watts feel like? Well, that's a medium jog. Jog 250 watts most of the day. That's why Daedalus project they designed for that range. Most of us, once we get a 50 kilo aircraft, we're having to put 400 watts, or you get a big guy like me carrying passengers, you've got to put in 400 watts, uh, and you're not going to go very far. You'll go fast, but you won't go far. Um, so the wing area, I won't bore you with some specs there, there, but when you come to some other stuff, you can refer back to that, what those wing areas mean. You're generally a metre mean cord by about 25 metres or more, 30 metres. Um, and with keeping the ground height above ground fairly low. Um, I'll talk, well, if I don't get around to talking about it later, there is a sweet spot. Um, in gliding, you learn about, particularly hand gliding, you learn about the ground effect. And you also learn about wind gradient. And uh, in the wind gradient, we're dropping down and we're having to keep speed on for that uh, in a glider. And, and in a human powered aircraft, we want that ground effect. Uh, and the theory is the ground effects within one span. So whatever your span is, that ground effect is what you're equal to. Uh, and there's a factor there. So the closer that you are to the ground, the better. But as you get close to the ground, it's turbulent air. That's no good for you. So there's a sweet spot around two to four meters. And we tend to fly in that one to 50 feet above ground level. Not a lot of point going much higher other than then you're taking more risks, but it'll make your turn easier but how much do you want to turn? Um, generally, we're mostly just flying straight because that's easy. The aircraft, you want to configure your aircraft that it is taking the pilot load off. Uh, our early experiences of giving talks after we did the first test flights was this is like doing brain surgery while you're trying to run a marathon. Uh, you've got a tiny little control stick. We, we had a little joystick at the time, and you're, you're seeing red and pedaling like mad, and you're just giving us more controls. So we just fly straight. Let's play a video, that first video. So this first video I'm going to show is the BBC came along to one of our events called the Icarus Cup, and the Royal Aeronautical Society had set up this Icarus Cup, uh, and... Uh, we carried on with it. So it's a competition between several aircraft. <laughs> Any volume with that? Or we, do I have to talk over it? I'll have to speak to it, though. Um, so this is some, they went through some old footage. Um, this is the, uh, the Southampton University. That's the first flight of the human powered aircraft, or re representation of the first flight. They probably didn't have cameras then. And then this is the Icarus Cup in the 2018, I believe. And um, this is an aircraft called Aerocycle. Uh, all our wings are made out of foam and mylar. This is the aircraft that I was flying, uh, Airglow. We had an accident, smashed the nose up, so we painted the nose red. To... And this is another Aerocycle that was the new development. So um, Neil Patterson came along as a microlight pilot and also a mountain bike rider. And this is Lewis Rawlinson. There they are practicing on um, a simulator that was set up in front of the universities. Uh, we get up very early in the morning, or late at night. And this is Lasham Airfield. So it's the home of uh, micro lighting, uh, home of human power flying. And you get some glorious photographs of sunrises uh, and aircraft having a go. On this particular occasion, we had a lot of rain in one of the mornings. Well, not a lot of rain, just enough rain to make it difficult. So the wings would get wet. 
and that spoils your laminar flow over your wing, adds a bit of weight, cools everything down, uh, and it's a big struggle for the aircraft. Neil's explaining what he's doing there. He said one of the tasks is we fly down the centre line and try to cross the centre line to show the manoeuvrability and the control of the aircraft, and every cross counts as a point, as 100 points. The task is scored around about 500 to 1,000 points maximum. Um, come back to John Edgley in a minute. He's a famous aviation designer as well. He's got another aircraft he's developed and spent a lot of money on these human powered aircraft. So here he is crossing the centre line. The only accidents you happen are the guys hitting the ground. <laughs> That's a very common accident. I've done it three times or more. But yeah, flying late at night and then you get up at four in the morning. So you pretty much sleep at the airfield, find somewhere to bunk down, um, get your first cup of tea in of the day, then roll your aircraft out. Um, Try and do as minimal assembly as possible. This is the wet morning. I mean, it's hopeless, but we had we don't get many opportunities to fly, so you take what you're given, um, and if it's you know it's reasonably flyable, I'm shaking the water off the wing there. See if I get you know I've just mopped it down, but it's still got more water on it. So we have a technique of the guy at the back pushes. We call him javelin man. You run behind and you throw. The last little bit of assistance into the aircraft. One of the things about your metabolism is if you get too exhausted just getting off the ground. So back to those watts, 250 watts, that's a cruise. To get off the ground, you need 400 or, or 300. So there's a, about 30% extra that you've got to commit. And if your metabolism gets too lactic, you know, too deoxygenated, you can't recover your blood thickens it's down on from there. So any assistance we can get the aircraft going makes it a lot easier. So here's one of the first opportunities, the first time that um, someone's actually flown a circle in the UK. Um, so Pip Buchanan, he just flown a slalom, carried on round, did a, a 350 to 400 meter big collateral triangle and then carried on landed in the the, uh, on the back on the runway. So that's the Icarus Cup that he wins from that. That that would have scored him several points, both for the slalom and the circuit and the duration. So we, the event allows you to score several things together. You don't need him. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so that Icarus Cup was the culmination of the, the Royal Aeronautical Society starting off the competition. 2011 Airglow had just been refitted. Betterfly was another aircraft that will come up, um, had just been uh, built. Uh, and we knew that a guy called John Edgeley was building an, an HPA canard at the time. Let's look at the next slide. Um, uh, and so those aircraft, in fact, the first Royal Aeronautical Society competition, there was something like seven aircraft there. Some universities were building HPAs. Um, come back to that competition a bit more later. So there's a bit of history here. Um, lots of early attempts in human-powered aircraft, along with early attempts in aviation. Uh, there's some really interesting people, some monks, one in Germany called Monk of Malm, who flew across the river. There's a monk in Malmesbury, Wiltshire, who was just down the road from where I was in the UK, who jumped off a uh, off one of the um, chapels and flew a distance but broke his legs and was dead. Stopped no more flying. He survived, but he was told not to fly anymore. Um, so the original Crane Prize is an industrialist who created Crane Prize for the for the human power flying. Uh, and so that first flight by some the university, Southampton, was one of the position winners. Then the attempt to fly a figure of eight because that was just a straight course, so is the aircraft controllable? You prove it if it's a figure of eight. Um, 
that spurred a lot of interest. And I think a number of projects were started around the world from those competitions. Southampton with some dates there. So Southampton Sunpack was 1961. Kramer Pies was created in 1959. So two years later it was, was, was won. Then, then there was this figure of eight competition that the Condor, Gosselin Condor in America won. Uh, and it's gone on from there. So Jupiter is so in the UK, Jupiter flew then. So there was, because there was a number of other projects, there was de Havilland, there was a, um, there was a Jupiter project. These people were all trying to extend from what was done. And then the real winning was came along when the Americans did it with the Gosselin Condor, who then won another Kramer Prize. So they then created another Kramer Prize, Fly the Channel. Um, Paul McCready then won that game. Um, and then the, the 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 real record was the four hour flight, just under four hour four hours creek to Santorini. The, the Americans who had been involved in this building um, a speed record HPA, then said, "Let's forget about Kramer Prize. Let's just prove the best we can do." Uh, and they got a lot of sponsorship, a um, million dollar project or more. Uh, they were really early proponents of carbon fibre. The, the Gossamer Albatross had introduced carbon fibre into the spars, um, but the Americans took it all the way by building Light Eagle prototype first and then two Daedalus aircraft, which they then flew Crete to Santorini. But the big expense of that project would be the logistics, getting the people there, understanding the weather, the waiting around for the opportunity. So next. So I sort of saw a video of Sunpack. This is a bit more, it's during 61, flying out of Lashem. So Lashem's just south of Reading, so halfway between Salisbury and London. Um, it's, it's the, they call themselves the, the World Gliding Centre now because it's all on gliding, but it, it was the early start for, for um, aviation. Won't see these so well, but if you go to the there's a British Human Powered Flying Club website, and it's got a history page. These are aircraft that were flying around that time. So there's a Japanese aircraft in the middle at the bottom. There's a French aircraft to the left. Uh, I think that's another Japanese aircraft above it. On the right are some of the UK aircraft, uh, Toucan and Puffin and things like that. And then uh, there's a an inflated wing there called the Reluctant Phoenix. Um, this is the amount of work that goes into it. This is Jupiter under construction. A guy called Chris Roper spent a lifetime and, and probably lost his marriage over building an HPA. Uh, they are hours and hours and hours of work. Uh, and back then it was all balsa wood and spruce and tiny little filaments. And if you walk past it and brushed it, you'd break something. So. Um, Real, real uh, labour of love. Um, and I think the big effort always is how do I change the labour content to my aircraft? Uh, and um, that aircraft took a long time to fly, but it did eventually first to win, uh, do one kilometre. The next one. It's Jupiter doing 1K. Next. So yeah, the Gossamer Condor was the interesting aircraft. This is when we really started challenging how we approached, well, Paul McCready challenged how we approached the project. Um, he took a hang glider design, basically hang glider wing, and said, right, how do I make this super light, super big wing area? Um, and, and the other important design consideration was not to focus on the detail of the design, but focus on a design technique and an iterative technique of building and rebuilding. So this is one of the very first Gossam condors. Um, and it's a single surface mylar aluminium tube. Um, nothing too clever about it, just lots of wires and super light, super big wing area. So he'd worked out the wing area and how light he had to do and just keep working and getting it light. Then once he got to that stage, he then worked, how do I control it? How do I make it fly faster? Um, so very basic design. The key element to that is you can't get aluminium to the strength and weight ratio you need. 
um, specific strengths you need for an aircraft because uh, you want a big thick tube but you don't want a heavy wall section industrial requirements for the pressure to extrude a tube you can't get the wall section thin enough to thin enough to a big area so you have to take a tube that you buy off the shelf and acid etch it and they etched 50 percent of the tube away till they had a wall thickness down from something like uh, 2.5 millimeters down to about one millimeter something like that you've got it really thin and light so if it hit the ground it break but they would just rebuild it. They've got a lot of tubes made and they just rebuilt it. Look at the next slide. So then by the time they finished that, they did about six iterations. By the time they were winning the prize, they'd double skinned the wing area. So the wing that said of a single laminate was double skinned and they'd enclosed the cockpit for the pilot and a few other mods and rewired it, rejigged it and worked out all the control systems. And the next one they did the same design, just did it in carbon fiber and foam. Still double surface, still enclosed pod, still the same control system, just got the calculations of wing area and speed better. So out of that, this aircraft came out of Germany by a genius called Gunther Rochelt. Um, and so that's a fully cantilevered wing and the props at the back. Uh, so no no lift wires, no, no rigging over it. Nice big chunk of um, carbon tube through the middle and through the fuselage and a pilot who's quite light and fit being Hall the Rochelle that's probably about 16 there with his younger sister as the passenger so that's the only passenger flying HPA in existence that's in a museum you could get out of a museum today and it would still win competitions it's a very good aircraft so the Daedalus project really big investment in a project. These were involving NASA and MIT, and they started from some really interesting assumptions. They actually did a lot of ergonomics and, and medical testing. They took a took an athlete and put him on an ergometer, which is oxygen, worked him hard and said, what's the best you can achieve? And they were planning that Crete to Santorini could have taken six hours. They weren't sure how long it would take. So that was the plan. They were working how do I make an aircraft fly for six hours on only 250 watts well they worked out they could get it down to 230 watts they could get the aircraft lighter the first aircraft was, was the, the light eagle which was a something like 30 meters fan but it weighed 40 kilos by the time they built this aircraft I'll probably check my stats later on uh, that was something like down to 35 kilos with a 32 meters fan 36 meters fan and yeah, the pilot was planning to fly for six hours. They did it in four hours because they had a tailwind. So um, lots of really good research papers. So when we're trying to work out what to do, we go back and read those research papers and um, see what they did, what they worked out. Out of that, a guy called John McIntyre, who was the designer of Airglow, he had followed the Daedalus project. He had um, uh, been on the one of the boats, chase boats, and fell in love with it. Thought, I want to build one, but I want to make it more robust, more user friendly, more available. Um, and out of that, he sat in his garage with his brother, and he was staying at his parents' place, and he had a place for a year. And within a year, they managed to put that aircraft together: carbon fiber spars, foam insulation, mylar covering machine design gearbox out of aluminium, built their own props. I mean, that was a phenomenal project. It's a really good aircraft. And we took it out of a trailer 20 years later, and all we had to do was change some of the bearings, place the nylon seat that had, fabric seat that had gone out, place the servos that were a little bit old. We could get some lighter ones. Really, really easy to get it flying again. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that. So those were the original guys. They, his brother, um, Mark McIntyre, a guy called Richard Lean, who became a pilot, uh, ended up flying with one of our teammates in, in BA, and Nick Weston, who also became a BA pilot and is still involved in our sport. So let's look at the next slide. 2011, we got it. Uh, we actually, the aircraft turned up 2010, Christmas Day. Uh, we spent about four months 
fiddling around in my spare time. 2011, we were test flying at Kimball. Kimball is Cotswolds, it's Cotswolds airfield. Um, they gave us permission to fly there, which was great. As you can see, there's not a lot for us to hit, which is what we like. Runways with very little furniture. We don't like runways with a little bit of a slope, and that's going up the slope. So you didn't go much further on that flight. Um, and the only way we could fly is that an airfield doesn't allow you to be there unless you've got insurance. And of course, human powered flying, who insures a human powered flying pilot? Fortunately, we could claim that aircraft was uh, the PM aviation test aircraft, and Bill Rooks and Robin Craig were our test pilots, check pilots for this for the bike flight. So we could turn up and say, yes, we've got insurance. Give off some forms. I wasn't a part of that, but can't have a sport without insurance. Um, and fortunately, the, at the end of 2011, the Royal Aeronautical Society approached uh, the British Hang Gliding and Paragliding Association and said, these aircraft are the same weight, size, equivalency to a hang glider. Let us start a sport, you insure us as pilots, do whatever we have to do as members. Can we go ahead with this? We want to run a event. And they did. They, they got on with it. Um, so, yeah, that's us landing at Kimball. Let's move on. Early morning there. At the end of that year, this is probably about October, this was however many years it was since the Southampton flight. So we were, we, we wanted to create a little press event. And we went into the Lash and took our aircraft, which was the only flyable aircraft at the time in the UK, and did some demonstration flights. There are some YouTube videos of that. Problem is the aircraft disappears into the fog. <laughs> uh, you see about 200 meters. Up. So this is us recovering the aircraft back up to the runway. And at the end of 2011, the Royal Aeronautical Society created this club, Icarus Cup. Let's have a competition. Myself and uh, Robin Craig, who was the test pilot at um, check pilot at PM Aviation, said, Right, well, if we've got an aircraft, let's form a team. And the really good thing about that is we had access to a number of pilots and glider pilots and hand gliders. So we got a really good team together. We haven't got a whole lot of time, so I'm going to skip some of these videos. Um, did we load one of these? I don't know whether we did. Um, but anyway, what, what's really interesting about some of this flying, some of the stuff we did, we didn't know what we were doing when we started. One of the first flights at, at Campbell, before that picture of us flying at Campbell, uh, we towed the aircraft up behind a car. Um, I was in the car, Robin Craig was in the pilot seat. We had a couple of lines between us towing it up. We had an experienced pilot, Radio control pilot sitting in the back of the car with a boot open, hanging onto one end of the line. And I don't know that we had a release from the pilot's end either. And we didn't quite know what the flying speed was for this aircraft. Uh, we knew it would be around 20 miles an hour. And I'm driving a car I'm not familiar with, which was diesel, trying to feel where 20 kilometers, 20 miles per hour is. And how much, where, where is it, 15, 18, creeping it up. Or some accelerators a bit <laughs> sudden sometime. So we crept up from 18 to 20 just like that. And not only that, Robin probably was sitting there going, it's not taking off and pulled full back stick. So at that split moment when I hit 20 kilometers an hour, 20 miles an hour, he'd pull full back stick and the aircraft went <laughs> up 20, 20 meters practically. Um, straight over the top of us. In fact, it was so quick that in the evening we could see the ground strike as the tail wire struck the ground and made sparks. It's like, well, stop. It's like, no, don't stop. <laughs> and they released the cable and I was trying to look out the side, where, where is he going to land? And we were running at a runway. So yeah, got a bit hectic. Um, but the other thing about this high wind flying with the first year then at the Icarus Cup, we're planning to, to try and score points. But now you want to go and fly as often as possible. You choose a windy day and then you're really on the edge of control. And there is a video of us learning to do that. And you can see the guy hardly moving very far forward, but he's popping around all over the place, um, having to put a lot of control input in. 
Um, but one of the great things about that Icarus Cup is that we got a lot of aircraft together. We wrote a lot of procedures about how to operate aircraft because we had a lot of experienced pilots. Um, and it was too easy for us to win the first year because we'd been testing the aircraft quite a lot. Um, that image of us flying there with a wingspan arcing up like that, that's the first, also the first time we flew it with a 29 meter span. So the aircraft had been 26 meters and we had interchangeable tips. Some tips, extra tips have been made, but never covered. And um, we thought, well, I was hardly able to fly at 26 meters span, so let's try 30 meters, it'll be easy. Um, but it did certain things to the aircraft. It, it created the styhedral develop a lot more um, and it flexed the wings right up. We, we did some calculations and, and little tests at the time to make sure that the carbon wouldn't break, but uh, it certainly made flying easier, but it changed some control issues. Yeah, this is us getting ready for Icarus Cup. Early mornings at Campbell, we'd, we went two or three times out to do some test flying. Check flying. We'd sleep the evening in the hangar. There was a Campbell Microlite Flying Club. There's his bed down there with the aircraft. We'd semi-rig it and uh, finish off the rigging at first thing in the morning as the sun rises. And if you're any doubt of what I used to work on, on the left there at the bottom is a quick, it's a PM Aviation quick aircraft. So that's the hang glider wing with the trike underneath it. Yeah, this is us testing. We had a new control system. Um, a guy called Mike Trulove joined us. He's a whiz on electronics. Unfortunately, it used to slow us down because he then had to code in the electronic controls for us. But uh, you know, once you got it working, it's good. Uh, test flying. Back Campbell again. This is the next one. Lots of these. This is the first time we flew the 29 meter span. So we just finished the covering done all our tests, check the wiring, check the load case, let's give it a go. Icarus Cup, yep, yeah, I'm cycling like mad ahead of this, trying to get the photograph back in, sky off the ground. So typical of event would be flying a kilometre down the airfield. The runways at Lashem are 1.6 kilometres, so we could just fit in a 1k event with a little bit of start and a little bit of end. Um, and uh, yeah, good. This is 2018. So yeah, Airflow had been flying at Icarus Cups most years. We did two horrific years where we were doing test flights before the competition, probably two or three weeks before the competition, and wrecked it completely, broke the wing. Here it is rebuilt. Um, and one of the rebuild opportunities was we had a twist in the wing, very, very slight twist in the wing, but over that, um, wingspan and uh, those flying speeds, it was not controllable in certain situations, um, particularly with the big span, I think, and exaggerated the turn because the twist was actually in the wing route and it just extended all the way through. Um, there was a twist in the in the extended tips, but we'd already taken that out. We'd knocked off, all, they're all foam ribs on carbon fibre, we just went, the whole saw, cut all the ribs off, repositioned the twist, bonded them all back together. But we couldn't do that at the wing route. There was too much involved in that. Um, and uh, we'd been working out, couldn't work out why we couldn't turn the aircraft in high winds um, to the right. And uh, it turned out that we had a bit of a twist. And there's an accident caused by that where I'd just flown, I can't turn it, I landed. Like True Love flew, he couldn't get it to turn, slightly high winds, he landed. Uh, and the next pilot got in and flew. He thought he could get it to turn. He just need, he just thought it, we were idiots, didn't know what we were doing. Carried on flying and flew a little too far into another aircraft. Um, wasn't very happy, but fortunately, they're so light and delicate that only this aircraft breaks, nothing else does. So that's been rebuilt. We took the twist out just by each wing section has a carbon sleeve tube that goes into it and then a little trailing edge pin. And we just reset the trailing edge pin by 10 centimetres, 10 millimetres. 
just change the way. And yes, it's not ideal, but it's better to be in control than have the idea of this. There's another interesting aircraft that was built in Britain that we never managed to get flying at an Icarus Cup, but it did fly at that time. There's a science program called Bang Goes the Theory, a guy called Jim Stansfield a lot of science stuff and he'd always had a dream of building a human powered aircraft. He got a budget together and built an aircraft within three months. This is him on the right hand side. That's his how much energy do I have to create to get flying and uh, he charges up a, a bulb, gets it going. So I got a screen grab of what his output was, but it's a useful thing to, to go over what it is when you're a human motor and a pilot. So the human motor, uh, as I said before, it's that 250 to 400 watts. Uh, see, a good athlete can knock out 400 watts quite regularly. Most of us can't. But it also depends on your weight. So most moderately fit people can output quite high um, power, but they can't sustain it. It's actually your lungs conditioning. Um, and then it all comes down to your weight. So we worked out for aircraft for Airglow, pilot at 60 k kgs in an aircraft at the time was about 42 kgs. Your takeoff requirement was 280 watts. Your cruise power would be about 230 watts, and that possibly was of the 30 meter span. That 30 meters, 29 meter span, would make about two percent difference. So that goes through a 65 kilo pilot, 300 watts cruising at 250, uh, down at the bottom there, an 80 kilo pilot would have produced 360 watts. Now that's 360 watts, that's, you know, having to, it's a pretty energetic run. And uh, and 310 watts to sustain, well, yeah, that's, that's a good athlete. Um, so I had to lose, I arrived in the UK at 90 kilos, so I had to lose a lot of weight. And they wouldn't let me on the aircraft until I was down to 82 kilos. Uh, so the only event I was useful at at the Icarus Cup was the speed event, because I was having to produce something like 380 watts to 400 to sustain that that long. But it was fun. Look at this. Yeah, so we're a modest source of power. You know, we don't produce a lot of uh, a lot of energy, and someone was making it equivalent to a light aircraft. You know, we're 200 times less power in a light aircraft. Um, so when you're trying to fly an underpowered aircraft, you actually really should treat it like a glider. Um, you're trying to reduce all the unnecessary weight. Um, you've got to get some really good structure. Engineering. Um, they're all long wingspans, really. There have been some early aircraft with Big wing areas, Condor was, you know, if its aspect ratio is probably a lot lower than normal, but it's super light. Um, so we're going for for very long wingspans to lower that reduced drag, get the aspect ratio high. Um, so wingspan is the predominant factor. Um, Daedalus over 30 meters, uh, and we're trying to, and then we look at the way you configure an aircraft for its flyability is you've got to release the ease the burden for the pilot. So it all comes down to this induced drag, span and power combination that you're offsetting in your engineering and your selection of pilots, in fact, actually, light ones. Um, so yeah, your wing induced drag goes down with the span, your aspect ratio um, is increased. Uh, your induced drag goes down the faster you fly. So um, this is this diagram on the right hand side. Um, but your parasitic drag, your form drag, goes up the faster you fly. So these aircraft, like the, they're never going to fly far. They're going to want to fly. Uh, they've got this wing area. Um, what they decided with the Daedalus aircraft that was actually okay to have one two lift wires wing wires on it so that aircraft originally had a wire and it also had a king post wire so 
the negative loads when the aircraft lands. The, the wings take a lot of load. Uh, it's a much lighter wire, but um, you still need something if you if you're not a fully cantilevered wing. So they worked out that the drag and the airspeed that they were flying at, a couple of wires is okay. Um, so the slower you fly, the more you're affected by wind. And the issues of the Icarus Cup, we're trying to... Oh, Mike's probably going. Um, if it goes any further, I'll go. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we're trying to get more people flying. So we want to fly at faster speeds. Let's, go, let's get through the next lot. So the, these are a number of um, aircraft that were designed to try and counter that inflatable wing. Um, one of our things in pilot control is that pilot burden. We started off with some fairly uh, big controls. We went down to some joystick controls, but they're both, you know, one might be more user friendly, but the other has a bit more burden. Getting, you haven't got the use of your legs, so you're trying to get all your control systems through one. Um, there's that Phoenix, 70, 75 kilo pilot, um, big wingspan. Even though it's a big wingspan, it's still got quite a lot of weight. Let's flick through some of these. There's the Gossam Condor. So just look at the span, 29 meters. Uh, the power is still quite high at 300 watts. The flying speed's not very fast. Muscular too. This is the Gunther Rochelt, the, the German genius. Uh, he built the second aircraft for the speed flight. Um, that's in a museum in in, uh, in Germany now. And again, that could come out of retirement and win. Uh, it's a very fast aircraft. It's flying. You can just look at some of those. Uh, Ten meters per second is typical. It probably was capable of 12 or 14 meters per second. Um, it had a smaller wingspan, 29 meters, 22 meters, but it was designed around uh, Holger Rochelle. They did a carbon fiber mold around him and then cut him out. So everything was configured. And then he lost, he was 60 kilos typically, he lost 15 to 20 kilos to fly it to get the speed record. Wrecked himself, apparently. It wasn't very good for his, his future health, but um, it won the records. This is us, this is Airglow with a 29 meter span. Originally designed for 75, 70 kilo pilot. This is us probably, we probably crept up in weight at 80, at 45 kilos. We did manage to put it in a dehumidifier in the trailer and we think we got some of the moisture out of the wing, out of the foam and, and, and got a few kilos out of it. Um, we're flying a prop with 2.9 meters diameter and we had a second prop made uh, a guy called Chris Roper I mentioned before he'd developed some props uh, and, a, and a website for developing prop design for HPA he produced a really good prop which was less efficient but produced really good power and it was really good for the Icarus Cup because we weren't flying so far we were doing short events and that's a 2.9 meter span have a look at the next one so this is AeroCycle. So that I mentioned uh, John Edgley before. John Edgley did the Edgley Optica, which is a kind of helicopter glass cockpit with a fan behind, the, behind it uh, and a slow-flying observation aircraft. He then went on to do, in the first two Icarus Cups, a canard. They didn't succeed. So he basically took the airglow plans, which we had available to him, and he built the same wing but put a, a conventional configuration copy of airglow under uh, and that's a very good aircraft and it's winning basically since he got flying and controlling it was winning the Icarus Cup on a regular basis um, 40 kilos it might, they might have actually managed to squeak a little bit more weight out of it built a second one which they certainly have got under 40, 40 kilos and they extended the span a bit I think the next aircraft was 25 meter span that's a 23 meter span um, showing there a power of 385 watts. Yeah, it might be more watts. I've flown that. It is about the equivalent. It just seems a bit easier to fly than this number of things. 
somewhere. Just look at me. So a guy called Alex Proudfoot, the American guy, built this aircraft. All the carbon fiber came from New Zealand, a company called SeaTech. Uh, he brought all their tubes from here. They'd never done tubes quite so thin at that diameter. Um, uh, he was a, up until that point, I probably was the heaviest pilot that had ever flown, but he's a 90 kilo pilot and he designed his aircraft for a 90 kilo pilot. So he's got a really big span, uh, 36 meter span, um, and quite a deep cord too, just over a meter. Uh, very slow flying, probably not a lot of energy going into it, uh, and it's easily, easily flown. A kilometer. The problem is, it's actually quite a delicate wing. It's got a lot of torsional twist. He tried another tip on it, got it up to 42 meters, I think, and it all got all very twisty, crashed. Interesting thing that happens is that as the wings twist on the outward section, you can't control the wings, they get into negative lift and then they just do that. They flex the wing down, just drive the aircraft into the ground. So they either break or drive the aircraft you can't control the twist and the bend. Let's have a look. Next one. So the people who are really making progress are the Japanese, and that's because they do a Birdman rally where they make you change the aircraft design every year, and about 10 universities that throw money at this. There's one of their uh, changes is they've got two props. I don't know if they've got two pilots in there, but they've got two props. Um, there they are going off a 10 meter span, uh, 10 meter high platform. And the tragedy of that competition is that you're not allowed to land the aircraft on the land. The aircraft is landed in the water and it's destroyed every time. Um, so yeah, they, some of them get rebuilt, but most of them don't. Let's go to the next one. These guys came out of that competition and got sponsorship created the Birdman House, and they produce a very slick aircraft. I think in 2017, this aircraft did at least 60 kilometers. Uh, they rebuilt it and they've done another egg. I think that same team have did, got close to beating the record they got up to. They were expecting to do 120 kilometers at the Birdman competition. They've stopped going to the Birdman competition recently because they decided they don't want to wreck their aircraft anymore. Um, we wrote these rules for the Icarus Cup and we submitted them to the FAI competition. And so we're trying to get people to adopt that. We've written to the Japanese saying, change your competition, fly the aircraft so you can recover them. But that's state of the art. That's a fully cantilever wing, incumbent comp pilot. Uh, I think it weighs less than in the 30 kilogram area, maybe 28. Not much over. Some of this, this specifications probably can't read that back there, but what's the interesting thing about there? Their design speed's quite low. Their prop dimes is quite big, so three meters. Their um, energy required is 215 watts. But if you minus the empty weight from the pilot weight, the pilot's only 57 kilos. So the Japanese have got this part of weight ratio advantage. Um, and they're all using this similar um, uh, aerofoil. Uh, it's, Daedalus, uh, it's the Drailer 21 to 31. Interestingly, out of that, because they have to change their design every year, one of the teams has started exploring new aerofoils and has done a blended aerofoil, which I've now measured what their blend is, and it's superior. So there's some really interesting, if they get that aerofoil going and that aircraft going, it's fun to watch. There's a team called Team Air. So there's about 15 teams in Japan. Let's look at the next one. So yeah, here, here's um, that Birdman house. That's their 40 kilometer, uh, 40, yeah, 40 kilometer flight. The first university, Wind Norts, Wind Norts, there's some good videos on YouTube of them really screaming it out and putting their last effort in as they go into the water and they've flown, uh, I think they've flown more than that before. That's a 20, 22 kilometer flight. I think the wind noughts have done a 30 kilometer flight in previous years. Um, yeah, so the universities like to campaign, we are the best university because we win this competition or we'll do well in it. So what's the challenges for the teams? The biggest thing is time. 
you know, I've said it's a year's worth of work for 20 seconds of flying. Uh, the windows of opportunity is small, quite time constrained by access to airfields early mornings, late in the evening, very minimal wind. We're trying to make the aircraft so we can fly in more wind, but still pretty minimal. Um, you've got to go through the general aviation traffic stuff. Uh, it's probably good training for the teams. We, we got quite good at getting a few members doing the radio calls and communicating. Um, funding, it's difficult for a lot of small projects or one-offs. Uh, you kind of need some backing, but it's not a whole lot. You could probably build an aircraft in today's money, a good aircraft. Uh, it's the carbon fibre that you've got to spend. It's still 25 metres of carbon fibre and another 10 for the fuselage. You know, you've got to spend about $12,000. And you could have a trailer to put in because if you don't, a lot of the projects get wrecked because they're not looked after. Space, airfields. So the next one. Um, yeah, we went through, I might spend too long on this, but we went through some crew and responsibilities and pilot responsibilities. And there's a really good set of procedures available now on the, publicly to the in the British Human Power Flying Club official website. Um, let's look at the next one. Yeah. The trailer is really important, transporting it to locations, keeping it, keeping the wings from getting damaged, having some tools in the back. Um, we do quite a lot of repairs in the field. Two, two competitions, the Airglows had a major accident and we've rebuilt it within two days, got it flying again. Not a super major accident, but a big enough one. One of the airfields, Sywell, put in these frangible lights Next to the runway, it was a good, a good airfield up to there. But you know, they're frangible for a normal aircraft, but a uh, HPA hits it, just falls apart. And we caught one little wire, that little lift wire on the side, one little light, and it just wrapped itself around this thing, uh, broke some carbon fiber bits. But we repaired it within two days. Typical construction this is Dash, the American one, carbon fiber tube, foam, standard sort of uh, insulation foam. Various types, pink foam or blue foam. Uh, it's got kind of the right density, easy to work. Knife it down to six, five mil, three mil sections. So you do those wing ribs at the five mil and you draw holes in them and mount them on. Uh, they've got a, lots of space. They're hanging their spare wing sections up in the roof so, and uh, they've got lots of labour available to them. Today's prizes, a guy called Jacobson, who's been involved in the UK uh, in this previously, got excited and, and donated a prize to the figure of eight, one of our competitions. Um, the year before, we got, Jacobson sponsored a, a FAI triangle. So this is the international rule that's out there, 500 metres equilateral triangle. No one's actually done that in the UK, and we were trying to get that money to get people to actually do it. We've done it on a smaller triangle, but not the full 500 metres. Um, there's still a Kramer Sport prize out. The equilateral triangle again, but you've got to do it twice and you've got to do it within seven metres, seven minutes total. So three and a half minutes round one way, three and a half minutes the other. You need to be flying at 12 metres per second uh, or something like that. And you've got to do it in windy conditions. Uh, there's a marathon prize. It's kind of a big figure of eight over five kilometres. That's 50,000 pounds. The Kramer Sports, 100,000 pounds. So there's some money out there, but it's not easy to get at. Um, they've started a cross-channel race. It's a memorial for the original cross-channel. That's another 50,000 pounds. And then there's, if you want to risk your aircraft in a Birdman competition, there's some prizes. Have a look at the next one. We go into some Mark Light magazines, we get a bit of press in the DHPA, starting to get a bit of exposure. Made, let's flick through these. These are some of the improvements we made to Airglow, increasing the crank position, taking the pod off, reforming the pod. That pod then made other aircraft's pods. Let's go on. Created a community, run events every year, run a website, keep communicating with Royal Aeronautical and Aeronautical people. Uh, we've got some procedures, calls, got that really worked out. 
you see the difference if you watch some videos of the Japanese and the Koreans have now got into it. Koreans spent a whole lot of money with their Royal Aeronautical Institute. They said, here's some, get 20 aircraft flying from the university. So they've built all this carbon fiber, same construction, but the wings are a bit twisty and floaty and they don't, they don't get some great flying. But what you do see is they don't handle the aircraft very well. They throw them into stalls, straight into stalls. They've got people running in front of the aircraft being smacked by them. Yeah, not very clever. Uh, let's look at some videos. Um, this is Better Flies, another aircraft that is slower flying. You can um, you can run along next to it while you learn. Move on. Let's have a look at the video. So this is, um, I think, going to be Cywell. If you watch this one, um, this was yeah, 2018. I think that's the previous one, yeah. Try that slightly different year, but it's, it's to give you an idea of the actual flying. I can have a rest. Actually, I probably can't because I'm talking. Anyway. So this is, um, yeah, 2019. So this was one of the last days of the Icarus Cup, I think. Um, in fact, this is filmed over several days. Um, I think we had damaged airglow and we were sleeping in the marquees in the distance while this flight was happening. So we decided we couldn't fly that morning. Um, too windy. This aircraft is a bit more controllable and smaller span is actually and quite responsive and so it can handle the slightly windy days. Um, so they end up getting more flying time and therefore scoring more points. Um, Yeah, so we, we have a minimal crew of about six. And you see we use about three to get the pilot in the air, and we use two others to chase, usually on a bike. Um, and uh, that means that once the aircraft lands, we can get someone on the wing to stop the aircraft falling further or catching a wind or allow the pilot to get out because the pilot weighs more than the aircraft. As soon as he pops off the front seat, tail hits the ground, so you need to have someone holding it. This is at Lashen. Lashen's got one very good airstrip and the rest of them are like this concrete and you can't actually land on that it's, because it's broken concrete, it's too rough. So you're almost better off landing on the grass. Here he is. I think he's trying a um, triangle in the opposite direction he did it before. And I think he gets all the way around. It's not the full 500 metres. That's probably only 350 to 400 metre lateral triangle. Or else it's, you know, it might be a figure of eight. It's coming back to figure eight. So they, the competition, you'll set up several different um, courses and the pilots will elect, elect to do that. Yeah, that's probably a figure of eight's coming up. And the other thing that happens in the background at Lashen, there's a there's a service aircraft servicing business. So occasionally we have to pull our aircraft out of the way while our 737 lands. So look at the next flight. This is the year before. That was a Clear. This is the first figure of eight flown UK. So it's a bit faster if you ever see the Gossamer Condor flights. They'll do a figure of eight in twice the time as this one does it. And he's taken off up behind it. Uh, Sywell has quite a slope, so he's got a little bit of an advantage of, of just getting started on a slope. Um, but once he's getting around the corner in the course, that's all effort. You've got to put about 30% extra effort to get a turn in. So he's working all the way around. Uh, 
Um, I think it's around twice the span. Maybe your span is double it. If you go under that, you'll still win in no problem. Uh, generally, you'd, you'd be safer doing more than that. So, yeah, not, you probably won't. It's quite slow. Um, skip ahead a little bit. Just last quarter. He's gone around and he's just coming around to the second end of his derivate. He gets around that corner and he just I think he's going to start a second figure of eight, but he fades. Let's leave it there. I want to move to one more slide because we're probably out of time. Um, and it's what's been done in New Zealand previously. Um, yeah, so we've had those are all aircraft that have been in the competition. Let's move on. Uh, there's more figure of Google on YouTube, HPA slash um, Aerocycle figures of eight. You see some really good flights. That one we just saw was the third of those. So that was recorded by several different people. We like people to come along so that we get lots of camera views because it does go over lots of views. This is the um, renewed progress. This is yeah. Alec Proudfoot's done this big aircraft and he's encouraging the French. The French did turn up to one of our competitions an aircraft that was a little bit delicate. Um, so he's been helping the French design and build a second aircraft on his on his project. Um, top aircraft there was a, a uh, came out of the Daedalus projects as well, another inspiration project that's in, in Australia and Tasmania. Um, and their first test pilots were, were, were women, like a lady called Sue Gray. Lewis McCallan was the first test pilot in, in Aerocycle, uh, in um, Light Eagle on the Daedalus project because the right part of rate weight ratio. Um, and we've had several others, ladies at the um, Icarus Cup competing. Mara Jennings was an American who came over, a very good pilot, good athlete as well, but scored very well. Um, let's look at some more. That's the ideal pilot. He's a recreational pilot and, a, and an athlete and uh, just jump straight into a cockpit and produce results. Um, let's move on. Those are some more videos. Find some time to look it up. Kit began in triangles, R rally. Reasons, the reasons to do it. There's lots of reasons there. Dreaming awake. We all have dreams about flying. All about innovation. But the thing that is an interesting focus at the moment is the STEM project. A lot of school in the UK, they're focused on STEM for education. I hear they're focusing it on here in New Zealand. These projects are um, taken on. There's one at the university as part of the engineering um, space program. Well, why would they do that? Because it covers carbon fiber, it covers precision engineering, it covers all the calculations that you need to do, it gets your hands on skills. Um, so we have actually, out of one of my talks, has inspired one of the schools to get their kids learning how to build radio controlled aircraft, the eventual hope that they might be skilled enough to do an HPA. Let's move on. Uh, yeah, we've moved out of, there's only been one event in this year, that's been the Chris Cup and the Birdman competition. We had hoped that the FAI would run a World Air Games, but that didn't happen. Didn't happen. Here's some recommended reading, if you ever get my notes. There actually are some notes online, sorry. But New Zealand projects, there's a really interesting project called the Boffin Coffin, which you can read out, read up about on online, uh, on Wikipedia. Uh, and that was an attempt in 1987. Um, it was towed into the air. Uh, it had a very unusual configuration. It's a tandem wing. The forward wings were swept forward. Um, apparently the pilot was recumbent. Push a prop. But it died the pro like most projects. It got full hangar ash and sitting in the hangar, got flipped up by a wind, got scraped, too much damage not enough um, hope of getting it back together. Uh, so it doesn't didn't go any further, probably in a museum somewhere. 
I know that it was an Auckland University project somewhere, but I can't find any information about it. It, uh, it got damaged and never rebuilt. Um, so John Frost, Auckland University. Uh, and then in 1983, there were some New Zealanders in the UK that started building an HPA uh, and it never got completed. So the interesting thing, you can study a lot of successes in HPAs, but it's really interesting to study the failures. And when you see what they, why they fail is that there's so much energy that goes into them. Once it all goes wrong, nobody wants to get it back together. And since I've been giving these talks, one in Christchurch, I then found out there had been another project down there, so in Hamilton. So there'd been two other attempts in HPAs in New Zealand. Aside from that. So I think that's the second to last slide. So that's it. Our goal eventually is to be either World Air Games, Olympic sports, or at least get more people doing it. Um, and uh, I guess the goal of my talks is, you know, we've had five attempts in New Zealand. None of them have actually got anywhere. We actually do can get them together because it's just like a the flying wings of a um, America's Cup sail or wing. We've got the carbon fiber, we've got the mylar, we understand how to put it together. There's no reason why New Zealand aircraft can't be a competition winner. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Roger. That was. Um... It was an excellent presentation. So um, I'll just kick off with an observation. There's a bunch of um, very successful track and road cyclists on the way back from Commonwealth Games at the moment. They've probably got a couple of years spare before the next Olympics. Um, you might want to have a chat to them. Um, second question is about this um, propeller blade you've, you've brought along here. Um, you, you lugged it in, so we might as well talk about it. Um, it's got an interesting wee thing going on at the tip there. So I was just I was intrigued about that, whether that's, is that deliberate or did you, you bang it into something? Um, that's actually deliberate. Um, this came out of a project that I did with the Airglow. I studied all the wing, all the props that we had at the time. Uh, at PNM Aviation, we had two other molds for a rope of design, which I talked about, but we also had a a prop blade for Bliesner. Wayne Bliesner was an American who did a human powered man eagle project. Uh, having studied the twist and the and the and the aerofoil and shape and assessing them for air glow, I had it all in my head. So I was back in New Zealand and shaped up a prop. And this was actually shaped out of a bit of uh, willow that was off our property and it was nice and easy to shape. Um, and this was the support last support point and it was I was coming to the end of that and I was about to whip it off and I looked and thought, actually, a bit of a wingtip's a really good idea. Um, because one of the limitations you have with the HPA is the prop diameter and the prop diameter gives you lots of efficiency. Um, and the Japanese actually have, there's a few Japanese aircraft that have a quite an exaggerated wingtip. And that, of course, gives you extended <laughs> diameter without extending your diameter. Um, I'm not entirely satisfied with all this with this prop and there's some marks across it there. I had this tooled um, and I was only going to tool it to there and then redo the tip and redesign it as a second piece so that we could actually make variants to wing tips or prop tips and change them around. Uh, and that's one of the things when we were putting air glow, new air glow prop on, the Roper prop was designed at uh, a 3.2 diameter. So we had more diameter than we needed. Uh, and I was trimming it down both the root and the tip just to get it to fit the air glow. So it's semi thought, but um, I wish I'd actually left a bit more material on at the time because once I thought of it, it was a good idea, but that's all I had left. Right now, just um, hand over to the audience. Here we go. Thank you, Roger. Uh, now, an aircraft, you usually use some flap to get off the ground. Um, uh, can you, uh, this issue of going from 360 to 310, say, watts, uh, if you're my weight, uh, could, could you change the geometry uh, and get yourself aloft easy and then make bridge that uh, 50 watt gap? Yeah. 
Um, yes, you're on to the next thing. Um, I've had in my mind a number of designs of how to get it flap on, but it's all weight. You know, how much engineering weight do you put in for what gain? Um, the better thing for me to do is put you in an aircraft called Better Fly, and that aircraft already has a big wing area, already has the right angle of attack, um, and it already is an easier aircraft to fly. Um, and it can take a pilot up to 90 kilos, no problem. So um, we didn't spend a lot of time looking at that. There was a few slides on Better Fly, but Better Fly is a um, something like 1.5 meter cord, average cord, over 26 meters from memory. Um, so its wing area is getting up over, is that over about 30 square meters around that area just under. So that's a lot less effort to fly. Um, and it has quite an exaggerated camber. So it's already as if it's got flap on. Um, and in fact, it's got a lot of twist in the wing too. So it's like all the flaps in the, in the route. So um, yes, if you can engineer reconfigurable wings for very little extra weight and very little extra drag, then yes, we should be looking at it. But you know, everything's been the focus on keeping it simple. Uh, let's see, a lot of questions, but first one, uh, I, I saw a few of the designs had, had servos. Um, have there been designs um, with like multiple control surfaces, distributed control surfaces, or uh, some autonomy, like wing leveling, or to leave, you know, leave the pilot or some of that? Autonomy is allowed in the competitions. So if you can show that you're, um, one of the advantages of having servos is that it, and when we switched to servo controls on the airglow, we thought about going to mechanical controls, but it did allow us, we kept the servos because it allowed us to do modifications. And one of our modifications was to put three axis control. One of the things I didn't say was we're all generally two axis control, so just elevator rudder. Um, if we want to fly in bigger winds, well, then we need to get three axis. Problem is, how do you get three axis for little weight? Uh, and that airspeed also, I don't know if you know, understand adverse yaw, you start putting ailerons on, you're getting the, the wrong effect sometimes. Um, we tried spoilerons. We tried, I don't know if you know, the Atos glider um, has, has a low wing speed glider for a hang glider. It's a carbon wing. It's a rigid wing rather than a flexible wing, and it has spoilerons. Um, so that's basically bigger spoilers as drag riders, basically. Um, dropping the lift on that side. Um, and we experimented with that on Airglow and got a moderate result. I don't think we engineered them well enough to get a good result. No, I don't think we made them big enough to get a good result. And we decided the extra weight was too much and we took them off again. But at the time we had a twisted wing, it was prior to our twisted wing. So yes, it's worth exploring again. Wouldn't you be able to use uh, 3D printing to make your materials lighter and um, more easily manufactured? We're working on it. Um, there is a uh, there's a new aircraft under design. Kit Buchanan is also an engineer, and I, he gave a presentation recently, and he actually has been working on 3D printed materials for a geodesic type structure. But I'm not convinced it's a lot of 3D. Right, we'll just sorry, we'll just um we'll just have a quick look on the chat here, see if there's any questions. We could you'll have an argument all year over that. Uh, I've recently decided the bell curve is better. Um, the other alternative is elliptical lift. I think it's it's good optimal lift on elliptical, but because you try to get turns in, you're likely to stall a wing. So I think the bell curve distribution, uh, my re understanding of it, reduces the adverse yaw and uh, will allow you to do turns. 
All right. Yeah. So there's no there's no questions on the chat there. So we'll just carry on with our live audience questions. Uh, human power is literally just human power and no other extra assisted power of any sort. Is that correct? For competitions, yes. And okay, so outside of competitions, is there any experimentation or development with, say, human powered aircraft and solar power? My work at Airbus was on a solar powered drone. The construction of the aircraft was identical to a human powered aircraft, carbon fiber, various light structures. Is there a combination? Well, Gunther Rochelle did exactly that. He flew over the Alps on a solar powered aircraft that was just a combination of his HPA that he converted to solar power. So the, the natural pro progression is to put solar power on the aircraft. The combination together, um, I wouldn't worry about the com combination. It comes down to budget. If you can get an aircraft with a bat, you know, a battery and a, and a and an assistant motor, then yeah, you get more flying time. As I said, you only get 20 seconds of flying time normally. So put some more power in there, and and we we learn to fly better, and we get more test flying and more experimenting in. But that would then take it to a whole different step of development, wouldn't it? A different sport. Uh, Actually, as it turns out, I've been in conversation with the CAA about an HPA in New Zealand, and they said you have to fly under a microlight license. Well, if you're on a microlight license, you may as well put an electric motor on it. It's powered. Yep. Thank you. Okay, we'll just um, just take one more question. Thanks. Um, are there any designs with multiple human motors? The terminology is right. Yes. Um, there have been a number of designs. I think possibly that Kiwi one, the Royal Spoonbill, no, it's the Newbury Manflower was a design, it failed. But I have seen a Japanese one very much succeed just recently of digging through videos of their flights. Um, uh, and uh, one came up of uh, a two man aircraft that off the 10 meter pier. They flew. Probably just over a kilometre or more. So you could say with a 10 metre start, that's not great. But what they did prove was that the configuration worked and the, and the strength worked. When you look at the flight, I can't remember exactly how it ended, but basically it was pilot error. This is why you need to train them better. And probably the decision by New Zealand to say you need a micro -like pilot's licence is a good thing. You need to know how to fly so you don't wreck your aircraft. Uh, and a two men aircraft, yes, you've got one of them with less burden. So yeah, it, it is. A, I believe the only way that that marathon prize will be won is with a two man aircraft. You've got to maintain it 12 meters per second for an hour. You're only going to do that two men in it because you've got to fly faster. All you have to do is a slightly stronger airframe, which the Japanese have proven. Um, you get your get your airspeed up and you hopefully you can all do whatever 300 to 400 watts each shared for those hours for that hour and you've done the done the marathon. Excellent. Well, thank thank you, Roger, for a very interesting presentation. Very, very comprehensive. Um, so lot, lots of links there in the video. Um, we'll have that up online at some point, so you'll be able to um, follow those up if you'd like to as well. Um, so yeah, thank you again, Roger, and thank you everyone for, for coming along tonight. So please give a round of applause.